Hey, it's Scott Patrick with another episode of the Brown Zone Zone Coverage Podcast. And it's a special one, the rare playoff edition. The Browns clinched the postseason spot with the win over the Jets. Joe Flacco threw for 300 yards for the fourth straight game. The run game got back on track, and the defense was good again. Here to discuss the exciting time is Dave Chodowski of Go, the WKYC Morning News. Happy New Year, Chud. Scott, happy new year to you, and what a way to start off the new year to talk about something we don't normally talk about, <laughs> a Browns playoff berth, and this city is rocking right now. Isn't it, though? I mean, what a it is an exciting time. You know, the fans got what they deserve, this team. You know, you, there are plenty of times during the season to worry, right? Could they overcome this injury? Could they overcome that one? And they've just overcome it all, and all of a sudden they're 11-5 and five and locked up that number five seed. Now, you were inside the stadium. I was not. I was watching it on TV. But I'll tell you, you know, I, where where does this rank, being inside yeah. that building with those fans as far as not the old stadium, not we're, we're just going back to 99, right? It, yeah. There's not a lot of amazing moments inside this new stadium. Where does this one kind of rank with the way the players were embracing the fans and vice versa and how that whole scene was? I mean, it it's something like we haven't seen much of. It's a great question, Sean. And I, I think, you know, I hate to be the, you know, recency bias prisoner of the moment, but I, I feel like it's at the top. You know, this is the first time this team has clinched a playoff berth at home with the full stadium since it came back in 99. Uh, primetime game, the way they played, you know, the first half was unbelievable, scoring all those points. Joe Flacco up and down the field, Ronnie Hickman with the pick six. You know, Jim Schwartz, the defensive coordinator, said it today. We're taping this Thursday afternoon. Said it today that he's been in the league for 31 years in the atmosphere Thursday night at the stadium was in his top five. Um, he's won a Super Bowl. So I think that just is in more evidence, another voice saying, yeah, it was really special. Obviously, the place is packed. Um, you mentioned the Browns celebrating with the fans afterward. Dave, Dave and Ajoku drinking a beer, um, you know, with the fans. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's got to be right at the top, Chud. I mean, that Baker game in 2018, was it was it that was something, right? And I'll never forget what that felt like. But it was different because that was, oh, my gosh, they've stopped losing, right? They lost however many, you know, or they hadn't won in however many games they had the one tie. It was like 21-game winless streak, right? So that feels different. That's like a kind of an exhale. This is a celebration and something that will continue into the playoffs. Yeah, that's a good point. Exhale is a good way to describe that one. But And, and listen, you had Run William Run and mm -hmm. uh, a few other individual moments. I remember, you know, just different wins, like with the snow or special moments where you're like, oh, that was pretty cool to be a part of. But when you consider what was on the line on national TV, by the way, they own Thursday night football. They yeah. always seem to win on Thursday nights. And um, it's just you're right it is up there now is that you banging on the trash cans that was so loud <laughs> on the broadcast no I, it was not um i went back and i watched it the broadcast and listened to it i don't know if it was a trash can or you know you know where the tv <laughs> booths are right like i don't know if they were banging on like the siding of the window because we get that in the press box every once somebody will every once in a while somebody will bang on the window and it's really loud when they do it, and it's kind of rude and it, it upsets some of the writers yeah um but I couldn't tell if that was it or if somebody really had, like, a trash can they were banging on. It's been fun, too, on social media, seeing the different things people are posting and the pictures of Flacco around town. And then, the you know, the picture, uh, I think it was Tom Withers. I don't know if you had it as well, the picture of him and all his kids mm. uh, and, his, and his wife. And, uh, I, Scott, I just, you know, you can't write these type of things. It just... It continues to blow my mind that this is all happening with Joe Flacco. It, it, it really is. It's it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost a, like a movie. Yeah, and when you're in the middle of it, Chad, I think sometimes when you're in the middle, you lose sight of it, right? You lose sight of how special it is just because you're there every day. But I don't think, and at least speaking for somebody that's, you know, in Berea pretty much every day, um, I don't think you can lose sight of how special um, – how unique this is uh, because it just, it, it's to such a great degree that you're reminded of it all the time. I'm reminded of it every day, every hour of just how incredible it is that the Browns are 11 and five and going to the playoffs 
And not only is it quarterback number four, soon to be number five on Sunday, but it's all the injuries. It's 38-year-old guy who hadn't played all season. And then not only is he winning games, he's four and one, four straight wins, the numbers that he's putting up, right? So it's all of this together. Plus, he's a likable guy. The fans have kind of embraced him, even though he used to be a Raven. Like, all that stuff plays into what incredible storyline this has been with Joe Flacco. And it's going to continue, right? It's at least it's going to continue into the playoffs. And for how long in the playoffs, we don't know. But, you know, the way he's playing, I could certainly see them winning games in the playoffs, right? Like, to me, that is not an outlandish thing to say at all. And if you'd have said it seven weeks ago, it would have it would have seemed crazy. Yeah, no question. And and how about that offense and uh, the points that they scored? You know, it it was incredible to watch Flacco do it again. And he just has the whole offense just yeah. working on uh, obviously uh, to to go with the pun here, all cylinders. <laughs> well, yeah, and and it's you know the one game you know the Houston game it's deep passes to. Amari Cooper. And then against the Jets, Jets, and it's not the first time, but you saw it, especially in that first half against the Jets, um, him finding David Njoku, right, for those catch and runs. And, you know, I kind of wonder how the Jets could allow David Njoku to be so wide open on those. Um, but he is. And I think part of that's the design and part of it's respecting Flacco's, you know, ability to throw deep. And Njoku will be in as a you know, help and protection and then release. And the linebacker drops deep enough, you throw it to him underneath and he runs away from people. So it's all of it working together, but Flacco's able to do it in so many different ways. He gets out of the pocket and makes that flip to Jerome Ford when it looks like he's going to tuck it and run and instead he takes off, turns into a 50-yard touchdown. So he's just doing it in all these different ways. And, you know, the word, and we talked about it last week, the word that comes to mind is sustainable. And it certainly feels sustainable. How about these numbers now? Four straight wins. I mean, they're stacking wins together. That's what we always talked about needed to happen. Eight and one at home, Scott. And 30 points or more, they're five and oh. And lifetime, 14 and three under Stefanski. So that's the goal, right? Get get 30 points right. and, and we're golden. Right. Obviously easier said than done. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you put up those points and the, the four in a row, Chad, they've never won five in a row since 99. So they have a chance to do it, you know, and who knows? And it obviously doesn't mean anything. They're locked into their playoff spot and it's Jeff Driscoll, a quarterback and other people are going to rest. And we'll talk about that. But if they have, you know, as meaningless as it is, if they get that fifth win in a row, um, there's something to be said for that. And there's something to be said for getting 12 wins. And the only team to win 12 wins with the Browns was that 86 playoff team with Marty. Right. So, like that's it's some rare yeah. air you're getting into when you start getting to 12 wins and you go eight and one. No, no bronze team in one eight games at home. Right. And the eight and one is the best winning percentage, at least since 99. Um, I mean, that's really hard to do. And all these things are, you know, a credit to the team, but a credit to Kevin Stefanski. Yeah, well, you're right about that. I saw that and it brought back great memories of the uh 86 team that won 12 games and it's crazy to think that that's the most they've ever won and they have a chance to tie that it is it is that would be something special no doubt now actually there'd be one extra game to do that now right, with, with right. the schedule the way it is uh certainly but um you know i'm gonna bring back this topic and and we've talked about this before on the pod maybe years ago i did a story on this on channel three sports uh when it was uh baker mayfield and, you know, right when he came in, there was all that feeling that maybe he was going to be the guy to, to lead us to the, you know, the Super Bowl, right, or that it could possibly be him. I remember doing a story on him, and I'm going to bring this back up, and something clicked this in my head. I, I can't remember where I saw it, um, but I'm going to ask you this. If Joe Flacco takes the Browns of the Super Bowl, <laughs> does he become the biggest Cleveland sports figure ever, maybe even ahead of LeBron. I mean, if you think about that, it's not outlandish when you consider the quarterback position is maybe the most popular or important position in all of Cleveland sports. The Browns are more popular than the Cavs. That's what most people say, sure. right? So I know that's a lot to say with LeBron and delivering a championship, but you know what I'm getting at? Does he become the like 
like is he the most popular guy ever yeah that's crazy thought chud um i i, I don't think he passes lebron and i'm gonna say that that's because number one lebron's an akron kid number two the longevity <laughs> of lebron right the two stints here how long he was here I mean, there's a chance Joe Flacco plays. I mean, even if he won the Super Bowl, it would be nine games. And then he could be gone. Right. right? Like, so I, I think, you know, in the moment, it would feel unbelievable. And everybody in the world would, or everybody in Northeast Ohio would have a 15 Joe Flacco jersey. I, I think if you got away from it, it would feel different. You know, not any less special and obviously be unbelievable if this team won a Super Bowl. Um, and it'd be the Browns and the first time and all that, right? So we all know everything that goes into it. Um, I, I just don't think it would have the longevity of a LeBron, but it would certainly be, I mean, it, it would, in my mind, it would be the best sports moment. I, I think you, I mean, and I hate to be a hyperbole, we got a long way to go, but I mean, it would be the best sports moment in Cleveland in my lifetime, right? I think it would, I, even though the Bron- even though the Cavs championship ended that drought, I think the Browns Super Bowl would surpass that. And, you know, most people I know, I think, would feel the same way, at least from an emotional standpoint. I, you know, we could talk about historical relevance and, you know, ending a 51-year drought and all that. But um, in, in the way they would do it and, you know, the, the guy coming out of his, you know, quote-unquote, quote-unquote, off his couch, um, it would still be something he would have, I mean, he would be this figure that every time he returned to Cleveland, it would be unbelievable, right? Like, and there aren't that many people like that. There just aren't. Um, so, yeah, th- that would be something else, Judd. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, how crazy is it if Flacco were to go to the Super Bowl or even win it? And then Deshaun Watson, still your guy next year. Right. I mean, you can't go away from that, right? You can't, as painful as it might be. I mean, you can't go away from, they, they built their whole franchise around that uh, contract. Yeah, I mean, you can't for a couple of reasons. It, the contract is the most obvious, right? You're locked in for three more years at forty-six million a year. Um, you just can't get away from that. And the reality is, as good as Joe Flacco looks, and it certainly feels like he can play winning football for the next X number of years. He turns thirty-nine in two weeks, right? So there's a shelf life to this. Uh, you know, I mean, we saw Tom Brady do to what he was 45. I and mean, Tom Brady's the greatest of all time. So, um, you know, you could make an argument about who would you rather have for the next two years. And I would listen to all those arguments. But I, I think if you're thinking logically and looking at all the factors and, uh, you know, you, I think over a long two period of time, you probably have a better chance of winning with Deshaun Watson, regardless of the fact that you're tied into him for that much money. So, um, now who knows? Maybe Flacco would come back as a backup. Maybe you know we don't. That's down the road. Um, but I think there's, I think there's a pretty good chance that it's one and done for Joe Flacco, and he gets a chance to go somewhere else and at least compete for a starting job. And he just wouldn't have that chance here. I just think that's the, I think that's the cold hard facts like you were getting to. Yeah, I think I got to go back to my question last week though. I think if if Watson was coming back this week and was healthy. I think I'm still riding the Flacco train here in the playoffs. Yeah, you know what? It, can you imagine that choice, that decision that Kevin Stefanski would have to make? Um, it'd be a tough one. Uh, you know, I, I I think you go with I think you go with the hot hand and go with Joe Flacco, and you see what the offense would do. And you know, I mean, we've seen the rust on Deshaun Watson the couple times he's come back, right? Um, you know, you have to shift your offense a little bit. Um, everything's clicking with Flacco. The protection's good. All of it. The defense is, you know, spread across all over the field. I'd agree with you. I think it would be it would, it would be a little bit of a touchy situation, certainly. Um, it would remind me something of that Tom Brady, Drew Bledsoe, right, when they won the first Super Bowl in New England. Now, things are different. Bledsoe, or Brady was young then. Flacco's old. Um, they could get out of that Bledsoe contract, I believe, because they did. Um, but that similar dynamic, right? Like Bledsoe was the guy, then all of a sudden this, you know, this young kid wins a game and wins a playoff game wherever he started winning games, and then you have to go with them, right? So yeah, I think they would probably wind up going with Flacco, but what a it would not be an easy decision or an easy thing for Stefanski to handle 
and you'd have to have Deshaun Watson on board and not make it not make it a uh, not make it a thing, right? Where all of a sudden it becomes about him not playing. Sure. Before we move on, and we have a lot to get to here for the uh, upcoming week. Anything else you want to hit on in that game of the win over the Jets? The only thing I wanted to ask again was just how the defense does it yeah. again at home. And it just seems like so many guys, multiple players stepping up, Scott. Yeah, and, you know, the thing that jumped in my head, I mean, we already talked about Flacco and Njoku. I thought the run game, which had been bad yeah. for the previous month, especially the previous two weeks, it averaged less than two yards a carry the previous two weeks, really got going and got going early. And Jerome Ford, I think he went for five and 11 and 10 and 16 and four of the first five carries really got things going. Um, and, and that touchdown that. by him was amazing. Right. And, and both of them, he put, and both were catching the ball uh, and both were breaking tackles, right? Inside the five, inside the 10. Uh, I thought he ran as hard as I've ever seen him run. And that bodes well, right? I think it means he's healthy heading into the playoffs. And you, you know, you just need some balance, right? Like we've seen the past game be really good under Joe Flacco, but it needed a balance. You get in the playoffs. You don't know what the weather's going to be. You just have to have the defense respect both parts of it. And I thought the run game, particularly forward, but it wasn't just forward. It was Hunt and Pierre Strong as well. Um, I thought that was worth noting. And defensively, right, Miles Garrett gets a sack. He draws a hold. Um, I thought Greg Newsom had another good game. He's been playing really well lately. And then, you know, you can't forget Ronnie Hickman. The guy who's got a pick six, the undrafted rookie safety out of Ohio State, gets a pick six, first interception of his career, obviously first touchdown of his career. Another example of how the depth is really showing up for this team. And Jim Schwartz said it today that he thought when that happened, the game was kind of over. And it happened It happened in the first quarter, right? But that's how it felt, like the Browns are playing so well. It's like, okay, um, this is going to do it. All right, Scott, now it's time to move on. Obviously, a, an amazing win over the Jets. And, you know, I think the city's fired up about it. And it's going to last all the way into that playoff game. But we do have one more game. It's kind of crazy to have a game that means nothing for the Browns in a positive way. Because we've ended the year so many times where these games mean nothing in, substantially, right? Because the season's over. But this is a different different ballpark now. Oh, completely different. And, and I can't remember, Judd, an, an example of when the Browns had the option of resting guys. You know, it certainly wasn't in 2020. They needed the win in the finale to beat Pittsburgh. You mentioned Run William Run in 2002. Um, they needed to win that finale. So, you know, you're going back to the 90s with Belichick, maybe, although they didn't win the division that year. So they were, I'm sure they're fighting for a wild card um or maybe they did to win the division 94 um but you know and then it's the late 80s but even then like i don't it wasn't it didn't seem like a thing where teams were really resting guys back then you know um maybe isolated incidents but uh, you know we were trying to figure that out the other day me and chris easterling of the beacon journal like you know like peyton manning and the colts seemed to be one of the first teams that really rested guys and i think they took some grief for it so this could be the first time the Browns have actually had the opportunity to rest guys because the last game has no implication, no bearing on the playoff seating. So, you know, to me, and I like your opinion, Chad, but to me, it makes all the sense in the world, especially given all the injuries the Browns have faced this year. Why would you put Joe Flacco at risk? Why would you put Denzel Ward at risk, Amari Cooper, Joe Batonio? Hey, we can go down the list and we can talk about which guy should and shouldn't play. I feel like Miles Garrett belongs in that sit down and don't risk getting hurt. Um, we'll talk to Miles on Friday, see what he has to say about it. Um, but I just don't think you can risk any of your big guys getting hurt in a game that doesn't mean anything. Well, you went right to my, my next question was going to be that. And I heard someone, I don't know if I heard it or saw someone on Twitter say something that you know, they think the Browns should play Flacco at least a little bit to keep them, uh, you know, keep them going. What's the word I'm looking for? Keep them, to keep, keep them, yeah. keep them sharp, keep the yeah. momentum going. I completely disagree and 100% agree with you. I don't know why you would play any of your main guys in this game. That is a meaningless game. Have them get hurt. The way I look at it is, are the Ravens going to go and try to, like, find some fake game during the bye week no <laughs> they're gonna rest their 
right? They yeah. they they earned the buy. So yeah. the Browns have earned this opportunity to rest their guys, especially with their bye week being so long ago. I mean, this couldn't have worked out any better. You you give them a, yeah. a week off. You know, I, I guess I understand a little bit to the degree of you want to keep going, but I don't know, man. It, and then you consider from it's going all the way from Thursday. I mean, this is a lot of great rest time for guys that are banged up, and we know how banged up this team has been. Yeah. So, and we've also seen that Flacco. I mean, the guy didn't have a training camp and came right off out of his house and was fine. I, I just don't see why you would you would play him in this game. I mean, if if he got hurt in the Cincinnati game, your entire playoff is ruined. Yeah. Judd, I, I agree with all those points. I think those are all really well said. Um, to me, and the Ravens are going to rest their guys this week. And they have a bye, right? They play the Steelers. The game means something to the Steelers. They still have a chance to make the playoffs. And the Ravens are going to sit Lamar Jackson. They're going to sit OBJ, uh, even though they have a bye coming up. So they're actually going to have, in my opinion, a where you can argue the rust versus rust thing. Like they're going to, their guys are going to have sat for three weeks, right? Not having played a game, you know, taking two weekends off from playing a game, but they think it's that important to keep their guys healthy. And I completely understand that argument. For the Browns, it's really just a bye week. And how many times during the regular season, that you know, teams get a bye, they don't play on that Sunday, they come out the next week and they're really good, right? Like there's a string, Stefanski, I think it's three and one coming off the bye. Andy Reid's got that great record off the bye. Like nobody thinks twice about it. Like, oh my gosh, guys forgot how to play because they had the week off. So they're still practicing. Joe Flacco's still out there throwing passes. Um, it, it just it just makes too much sense to rest these guys, give them some extra time, especially given everything that they've gone through this year. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree with you. We're on the same page there. Um, interesting, interesting to hear anyone else feel differently about yeah. that. But uh, I mean, again, and I just go back to it again. I mean, could you imagine if Garrett or Flacco got hurt in this game in Cincinnati? I can't, I, I can't say it enough. So, right, right. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's get in. I, what is interesting, fifth starting quarterback, Scott, in yeah. one year, Jeff Driscoll. Incredible. I mean, how did this all come about? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you had the DTR, right? Dorian Thompson Robinson gets hurt against the Texans on Christmas Eve. Hurts his hip. And I, I think when it happened, it was a little under the radar. I mean, it's Christmas Eve. The Browns are winning big. Um, that's when they had all the backups in. And then the Texans scored twice. So then they put the starters back in. I think part of the reason the starters went back in, I think the majority of the reason was because the Texans had made it a game or at least close the gap. But part of it was because DTR wound up not, I don't think he'd be able to go back in. And if you rewatch it, he limps off. So they need to bring in a third guy. And, you know, they have P.J. Walker. The Browns have won with P.J. Walker this year. And, you know, it, this is not a huge, I, I don't this is, I don't think this is meant as a huge slight on P.J. Walker. I just think the Browns feel like they've maximized what they could get out of him. And if you got to bring in a third guy anyway, Maybe bring in somebody that has experience with your system, which Jeff Driscoll does. He's 30 years old. He was with Alex Van Pelt in Cincinnati for a couple of years. Um, he comes from Arizona. He's on the Arizona practice squad this year. And Drew Petzing is the coordinator there. And he was a Browns co quarterback coach a year ago. So he they're running the same system in Arizona as they are in Cleveland. So the system's the same. So it's a smooth transition. And – I think, I mean, the impression I'm getting is they want to see Driscoll go out there and then they'll make a determination about who the backup quarterback is in the playoffs. And if it's P.J. Walker, all right, it's P.J. Walker. If it's it winds up being Driscoll, you know, maybe he gives him something that Walker doesn't. Now, he's a big guy. He's like 6'4", um, you know, and I've seen him play, right, because he played with the Bengals in 2018. He came off the bench for Andy Dalton in a game down in Cincinnati. And then he actually started against the Browns in Cleveland at the end of the season um, in 2018. The Browns won that game. I don't remember a whole lot about it. Um, but the point is, so, you know, I've seen him play, whatever. But he's got this reputation as being really athletic. So he's 6'4". He's a big dude. He's like 235. 
He's an athletic guy. So, you know, I don't know if they think that he can do some of the stuff that DTR did, you know, some of that, um, you know, quarterback run stuff, if they want to change a pace. Uh, maybe they think he's a lot similar body type to Joe Flacco, where it's not an adjustment going to P.J. Walker. Uh, maybe he can run all the same play action and bootleg stuff that Joe Flacco does. So it's going to be interesting to see how he plays. Like, if he plays well, then I think there's a discussion. Is he the backup? Um, you know, can he pick things up that quickly? What have you. So, you know, I mean, he's a guy that's – he's a journeyman. You know, he's – like I said, he's 30 years old. Um, let me find his career record here. It's not – you know, his career record is not great, you know, but he's a journeyman. He's mostly a backup. He's 1-9 in nine in his career, 59% completions, 14 touchdowns, 8 picks. So that's not bad. Um Played one game for the the Texans last year when Owen won as a starter, but completed 70% of his passes. But he's so athletic that the Texans used him, I think, as a tight end last year. And when he was in Cincinnati, they thought about having him as a receiver. So that's how athletic this guy is. Um, spent some time with Detroit, some time with Houston when they were bad. Right? So it's not like he's been on any great teams. Uh, but, yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see. My, you know, for a game that doesn't mean anything – um, in the standings, it means things to people and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I, I think there is reason to watch, and I'm curious to see how he looks in this offense. So the bottom line is that if anything were to happen in Flacco in the playoffs, they would hope this would be their backup. I kind of think so. Um, I, I think I, I think they like that option, and that's why they want to see what he looks like on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, you know, because they, they could have found a guy to come in and been that third guy, like the emergency guy, right? They could have gone, they could have added a guy to the practice squad, but they went and signed him to the 53-man roster. And those are precious, especially when they're dealing with all the injuries they are. They want to rest guys in this game. So, you know, you can only rest so many guys. So there's going to be guys that have to play. So let's say by having Jeff Driscoll on the active roster versus the practice squad, maybe it means player X has to play instead of sit on Sunday. So I do think the Browns think this is an important, that he has a chance to fill an important role. Um, and, and that's why they're looking to see what he can do against Cincinnati. Yeah. I would not be surprised if we get to, you know, wherever it is week one of the playoffs, Jacksonville, Houston, Indianapolis, um, and Driscoll's your number two and PJ Walker's your number three emergency guy. Let's get to injuries now. A scary moment with Elijah Moore. Uh, wow positive reports there right and how are we looking elsewhere geez chud i mean that that was really scary and we've seen concussions um you know you think of tua when he i think it was Tua last year with miami where it looked really bad well you know i mean elijah morris he gets his front of his face driven into the ground um it just looked different than other concussions right usually it's the back of the head bounces off the ground that's part of it you take a direct shot to the head and this was gets tackled and the front of his face goes into the ground. Um, Menendez on the ground and he's twitching and his head's twitching and his arms are twitching. So really scary. He goes to the hospital, um, is released the next morning. And then six days later, he's back at practice, which is remarkable. Um, I, I don't know if he'll play this weekend or not, but he's not running around. He looks normal to me. Uh, you know, when I was watching him run routes, um, he's been limited the last two days. But, you know, certainly I would think he's ready for the start of the playoffs, which, you know, I don't know if you would have thought that when you saw how it went against the Jets. Um, so that's good news. Amari Cooper is not going to play against Cincinnati, but I asked him today about the heel. He said he's going to be good to go by the time they get to the playoffs. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest one to watch, there's a couple to watch. Dustin Hopkins, the kicker, hasn't been out there since he pulled that hamstring against the Texans. Certainly not going to kick against Cincinnati. I think it's questionable. Maybe at the best it's questionable if he can kick in that first round playoff game, but we'll see better next week. Um, so that's something to keep your eye on. They got Riley Patterson filling in. And then, um, you know, but Corey Bohorkor is the punter. He should be okay this week. Um, they cut the other punter that had filled in last week. Um, I'm looking at the list here. Uh, that's to me, that's the big one. Dustin Hopkins is the big one. Um, and then Ogo Okoranko, you know, he's got that. That's torn, what I was going to just yeah. bring up. Yeah. Yeah. He's got the torn pack. Um, but you know, I don't know if it's fully torn. I tried to ask him today and he goes, hey, I'm not allowed to talk about specifics, 
but he's practiced the last couple of days and he said he feels good and he said he's getting better and he said he wants to be part of the Super Bowl run. Um, and those are his is that words. kind of a is that kind of a surprise? Like when he oh, did yeah. you think that maybe he was done? Well, I, I did, Chud. I mean, you know, he went and got second opinion and maybe even a third opinion. He was gone from the team for a while, and the hope was that he could figure out a way to play through this. And he tried even when he heard it against Jacksonville. He played in the fourth quarter and he could barely lift his arm, but he tried to finish the game. But that's a tough injury. Like it's probably going to require surgery. Maurice Hurst had the same thing, and he had surgery immediately. So I don't know if Oboe's just isn't as bad. You know, maybe it's a partial tear and he's going to try to play through it. But it certainly seems like, I mean, they didn't put him on IR. They've kept this roster spot. Um, I think he might even play Sunday. Like he talked about wanting to knock some rust off. So I wouldn't be stunned if he were active and got at least a few reps to see how it went. Um, but that that's, it's a big boost for the Browns. And I think it's certainly a surprise. And then like a guy like Anthony Walker Jr., like he won't play this week, but I think he's got a chance to play against the Bengals. Um, so I think they're trending in the right direction. We'll find out more about Grant Delpit. Like this is the last game he needs to miss on IR. You know, he had that groin slash core muscle surgery. It's kind of a four to six week injury. He'll have missed four games. Is he ready for week one of the playoffs? You know, I, I think those questions will we'll have a better answer to next week. All right, Scott, I'm going to put you – under the gun here with the okay. big question all right, all right and i hope you can get this right the pressure is on <laughs> all right what what do these five guys have in common joel petonio amari <laughs> cooper miles garrett david njoku and denzel ward do do right. I, I know this one Chad. all right they're all pro bowlers that's right you're right good job thank you very much yeah how about that how about five that? pro bowlers right that is awesome. I mean, that, you know, those are the things that come with a season like this. You know, you, you have you know, guys that are rewarded. It kind of re just, it rewards the whole franchise. And it, you know, I just remember th that feeling. And again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but these are the feelings we don't have a lot right. often. So it makes it that much more special and exciting. Congrats to all of them. Well yeah, deserved. It, it goes hand in hand, right? Like they have, you have to have really good players to have this type of season, but then when you have this type of season, those type of those players do get the recognition, right? That sometimes they would. So yeah, Garrett, Petonio, and Cooper were voted starters. Denzel Ward and Njoku were backups. And then there's a ton of alternates. Bahorquez, Hopkins, Delpit, um, Jeremiah Wusukoromoa, center Ethan Posick, right guard Wyatt Teller were alternates. And you can make a case for all those guys. Um, Petonio was talking today and he thought – Hopkins and JOK were the biggest snubs, which is interesting because I really do think JOK has had a breakthrough season. But the problem with him is the voting, they classify him as an outside linebacker. So you fall into the same category as a guy like TJ Watt, who's a completely different position player, right? He's a pass rusher. JOK is an off the ball guy, but they get lumped in together. There's not just the edge rusher, which then would put TJ Watt in the same category as Miles Garrett. And then Hopkins loses out to Justin Tucker. You know, the Baltimore kicker, he might be the best kicker ever. He's had a good year, and he's on the best team in the AFC. But he hasn't had the same year Justin Hopkins has. Hopkins has been better. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's understandable why people would pick would pick Tucker. But Hopkins, Hopkins had the better year. Yeah, what a fantastic year for him. And... Congrats again to all the guys. That leads me into this next one. Garrett unanimously voted the Browns player of the year by you guys, the local media. And Joel Petonio wins the good guy award. And we already talked about him the other week about uh, uh, he's your go-to guy. No yeah. surprise there. No. And, you know, Garrett is unanimous. It, it means something to be unanimous, right? Because there's, I don't know how many people vote on this. Let's call it 15. I don't know. Um, you know, to get everybody to have the same opinion, it's not easy. You've been in that room, Chud. Um, and there's other guys. Like, you know, you can make an argument for – you can probably make an argument for Joe Flacco. You can make an argument for Dustin Hopkins. Like, they belong in that discussion. But nobody has played better over the whole season than, in, ha in my opinion, had a bigger impact than Miles Garrett, right? Which is probably why he's going to be defensive player of the year. At least he's the betting favorite right now to be defensive player of the year. So – you can't be defensive player of the year 
and not win your team MVP, right? That would be hard to do. So I thought that made all the sense in the world. And there were a bunch of guys nominated for the good guy because it's a pretty good locker room to deal with from a media perspective. Anthony Walker Jr.'s, um, you know, I, I voted him number two behind Batonio. Or I take that back. He was he would have been my third. I voted Greg Newsom the second, number two, because he's always in the locker room. He's always available. We'll talk to you anytime. Uh, and that's, you know, I mean, you've done this job, Judd. It's it's you appreciate when guys are available, when they give you good quotes, when they sit and talk to you and um, aren't a pain and don't say, hey, I'm only talking for 10 minutes a week at the podium. And Petonio, Walker, Newsom, you know, and the Joku was on that list um, are guys that don't do that. And you can get them at their locker and they're they're really good. You get them after losses. Right. That's another kind of criterion um, in Petonio's like the best of that. Yeah, I've definitely been there and, you know, it makes it so much easier when the guys are uh, accessible and also when they are accountable. I, you know, I understand you're frustrated after losses and, and things happen and everyone's human and you have stuff that happens in your daily life. But, uh, you know, I, I and Scott, I've experienced it with all the teams. I mean, right. NBA with the Cavs uh, on Major League Baseball side of it, you know, all college football how about uh you know guys that are amazing are nascar guys yeah. <laughs> believe it or not it's, I believe it's been that. a long time but they, you know they're always they're always uh very easy to talk to and you know are always there so i i, I get it i mean you know you're dealing with and it's not, uh, managers and coaches that you deal with as well so sure. uh yeah that's pretty cool um definitely i'm sure you could share a lot of stories um <laughs> but we don't have time for that now. We need to move on. Um, I did want to hit on this before we get on to the, uh, I got two more subjects to hit with you, obviously the the picks and all that. But uh, before we get to that, I just wanted to see if you had anything to say about Frank Ryan. Uh, for one of the best Browns of all time passed away at the age of 87. Um, last Browns championship, 1964. And he was the man. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that says it there, Chud is, in 64, he was a quarterback. There was three touchdowns to Gary Collins, right, is they upset the Colts, um, you know, the last championship for this team. So, yeah, he's got a huge place in franchise history, right? He's not a Hall of Famer, um, so he's not in the Ring of Honor. Um, I assume he's in the Legends. I would have to look, look into that. He definitely should be. I think he's probably should be considered for the Ring of Honor just because you're the quarterback on that last championship team. So, yeah, he's he's one of the guys that needs to be recognized when you talk about this franchise and the history of this franchise. And he's got a really interesting story. He worked on his PhD while he was playing, becomes, you know, gets his doctorate, was the AD, you know, uh, athletic director at Yale. Um, he did all kinds of stuff off the field when he was done playing. Super smart guy. Um, yeah, it was a big loss for, you know, kind of the bigger picture of Brown's organization. All right. Thanks for that uh, tribute there. Um, wow. That was a, a great time to be a Browns fan, certainly. And we hope that, you know, that it, it is the time now, right, as we get to the playoffs. And right. I guess we'll transition into that. Scott, who do you want to play? I mean, we know that it, they've locked in the fifth seed, which we've talked about before. If you weren't going to win your division, that's the spot you want. I think it's amazing that they get that spot and they play the winner of the AFC South. And quite frankly, would rather play any of these three possibilities than maybe anyone else in the playoff field. Would you agree with that? Oh, there's no doubt. There's yeah. no doubt. Now, I think, you know, I think the the Chiefs are vulnerable. Um Miami looks vulnerable having, you know, what they did Sunday, what happened to them Sunday in Baltimore. They lose Bradley Chubb. Two is banged up a little bit. Um, Buffalo has been up and down all year. But, yeah, if you had your choice, it would be – and you have to go on the road, it would be to one of those AFC South teams. Now, I think you can rank them, but it would certainly be the AFC South. So, in that regard – which of the three do you want? I mean, yeah. rank them one, two, yeah. three. I think you go. If you're saying easiest game for the Browns to win, I would go Colts. And 
I, I'd probably go Colts, Texans, Jaguars. Um, and it's interesting because LeBron's have beaten all three this year, right? Kevin Savansky's I think he's ten and zero. He he right? he owns the AFC yeah. South. Ten and zero against <laughs> AFC South. Um, right. Yeah, you know, the toughest game was probably against the Colts, but that was also the Deshaun Watson starts and gets hurt, and then PJ Walker comes in. They give up thirty eight, which the Browns defense is the worst, probably the worst game the Browns defense has played this year. Um, I, and it's not like Gardner Minshew's bad. But I think if you rank the quarterbacks, I think I'd put Minshew below Trevor Lawrence and C.J. Stroud. So that's why I would go Colts. I think the roster's not as strong. Uh, I'd probably go Houston next, although Houston would be a different team with Stroud than the one the Browns saw a couple weeks ago on Christmas Eve. Um, I think the Browns could win in all three spots, but that's how I would rank them. Yeah, I think um, interesting you answer that way. I think the Colts is the layup number one team you want to face. They already won in Indianapolis of those three teams. I think that's that's the one you you root for. If you didn't have Stroud, then I think it would be the Texans. But I think the, the debate between the Texans, Jags is a good one. And I think you and I are on the same point. I think I'd be a little nervous going to Houston facing Stroud. That said, Jacksonville has a little more experience. Mm-hmm. And I think it all comes down to Trevor Lawrence. I mean, if he's healthy, I think that I'd put them number one. If he's not healthy, I would put them number two. I mean, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And he's dealing with the shoulder injury. He didn't play last week. Limited right. the last two days, you know, the last two days in practice this week. Now, they go to Tennessee on Sunday afternoon. And if they win, they're in Jacksonville. We'll know Saturday night who would make it if Jacksonville falters in Tennessee because Houston – and Indy plays Saturday night. So that's worth watching. Do a little advanced scouting to see if that's one of the teams, or if the, that's the team the Browns will face next week. Um, and then you got to wait till 1 o'clock, and we'll be watching the Bengals game from Cincinnati, keeping an eye on that Jacksonville game, because then you get it, then you'll know, right? Then we'll know Sunday at 4 o'clock where the Browns are going to go. We'll probably know later Sunday when the Browns go. It could be Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. Um you know, it's always a net TV thing. If I had to guess, I guess the Browns play Saturday, but that's just a, a guess. Um, and we'll find out if we're going to Jacksonville, if we're going to Indy, or uh, getting on a plane for Houston. Yeah, I was looking at it online the other day, the format. There's two games on Saturday, three on Sunday, and then one on Monday, right? You got the Monday yeah. night football game. Yeah. So it seems like the AFC South, you always on a Saturday. I mean – how many times have you seen Texans Bengals or you know, the, the, the AFC South team on the Saturday? And I'm, I'm sure, you know, the, the Browns do give. Um, I think the Browns, as they move along and get better, they'll get more of the, the TV exposure in that um, regard. But I think being that it's been a long time since they've been in the playoffs and it's who they match up against. Yeah. I mean, like if it was Browns Chiefs or Browns Bills, that'd be one thing. But Browns versus the AFC – Versus the AFC South team, I don't think gives as much uh, zing, I guess, to be on Sunday. Because I, I think, I think what they probably do is they they look at that uh, Saturday night game, the Monday night game, and the Sunday four o'clock game. Oh, and then there's Sunday night Sunday football. Night. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think uh, I guess what I'm saying is I think the two the two lowest ones are the one o'clock Sunday and the four o'clock or four thirty on Saturday. Yeah. So. That's interesting. You're probably right. I, I for sure think Sunday night's number one. Sunday at four is probably number two. Yeah. Monday night, number three. And then I think you probably argue Saturday night or Sunday at one is the fourth game. Um, mm-hmm. and, and yeah, I think like the Browns are a good story. Joe Flacco's a great story. I, I think it's more about the matchup. I don't think either any of those AFC South teams are sexy. Um, and then who else are you going against, right? Like, Dallas is going to be in a primetime game, right? Philly's a big market. They'll probably be in a primetime game. Can't Mahomes is a good draw. I mean, it, it could be – it's going to be Mahomes versus Miami or Buffalo, right? So mm-hmm. either way, that's a big-time matchup. You figure that's 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 either primetime or 4 o'clock, right? So you know, the Browns are kind of down that pecking order, and I, I do think a lot of that's just because they're playing a South team. Yeah, because you know Dallas is going to get one of the sure. big ones. Sure. No question, regardless of who they play. Um, so, but I, yeah, I, I think you're probably looking at Saturday. But um, 
needless to say, uh, it's going to be exciting. So let's look at uh, this final game. Yeah. You know, I didn't uh, – let's see. We both got the uh, uh, p- prediction right last week. So let's see. I forgot to write it down. But the Browns are uh, 11, 11 and 5. And I think you're – let's see. You are – are you eleven and five, or are you twelve and four? I think I might be twelve and four. You're twelve and four. I'm eleven and five. You jumped up one on me. So Ooh. Browns are eleven and five. You're twelve and four, and I'm eleven and five. So here we go. This is a tough one, man. I mean, how, yeah. how do you even predict this game? I mean, I, the Bengals minus seven. They have nothing to play for, but they're at home, and they're probably playing more of their starters than the Browns will. The Browns are going to not play their starters, or at least most of them, right? I mean, what is the ratio, by the way? Did you hit that earlier? I can't remember. Well, I, I mean, I don't know if I hit it exactly. The problem is you can't rest everybody. Because you only can't have, rest everyone. You right? only have 48 guys active, right? So I think there's probably 10 guys that sit, you know, 10 of your main guys, and then you kind of got to play everybody else, or at least have everybody ready to play. Like, I could see a guy like Jerome Ford, the running back, being active and dressed, but Pierre Strong and maybe even bring up somebody from the practice squad, get a bunch of the carries. But if you need him, you go to Jerome Ford. And you could probably mm-hmm. say that for several positions, you know, um, like a guy like JOK. Like, I don't like, I, I think JOK is so important that I would try to rest him. But, you know, do you have enough bodies? Do you need him to play a couple snaps? Or do you need him just in case he needs to play some snaps? You know, something like that. So, you know, I'm guessing 10 to 12 guys just shut down and then everybody yeah, else has to be around. So about 10 to 12, everyone else around. You, you got you're, – you're not going to be showing too much of your playbook. I mean, that said, I mean, you've seen a whole season of the playbook, but you know what I mean. I, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't think they're going to be doing a lot of crazy stuff offensively. That said, Driscoll's going to want to win, man. He's a human being. He's a quarterback that's going to want to prove himself. So, you know, it's just a matter of how much talent's around him, you know, and how much the Bengals care. I don't know. It's a tough one. I mean, over under 37 and a half. So uh, I think you're up first. So we'll go, we'll yeah. start with you. I mean, it, it's really hard. Judd. Here's where I'm going with. Stefanski keeps stressing how, how they want to win, right? That it's the number one goal this week is we want to win. Um, and while the Bengals – I, you know, I think they're going to play more of their guys, like you mentioned. I think Jamar Chase is going to play. He said today he thought he was going to play. I just think the Bengals are done, right? And I think there's an emotional letdown. I don't think there's going to be much of a crowd. And I think the Browns are riding high. So I, I'm going to take the Browns. I don't know how it's going to play out. Like, I don't know if Driscoll throws the ball a bunch. I don't know if Stefanski hands it off a bunch. Um, you know, like, gets it go, you know, let's get this game over quick. If you run it, you know, you just run in the line, not much can happen. And if that, you know, if they go three and out a bunch, then I could be wrong. But I do think they want to see what Driscoll looks like. So I'm going to go Browns 23-22. 23-22. Yeah, no, I just made that up. Yeah, yeah obviously. That's an odd <laughs> score. I, we, I don't know if we've ever had a 23-22. <laughs> my gosh. All right, so Petrak going Browns. Uh, hold on. Let me get my quarter real yeah, quick. Right. So I can, yeah. Or no, hey, I, I have another idea. I I have another idea how I'm going to go about this. Pretty simple. And I'm going to be – I'm an honest guy, Scott. I'm going exactly opposite of you. Whatever you picked, I was going the other way. It's that simple. Yeah, because – right? Yeah. Because if the, Beng- if the Bengals win now, we both finish 12 and 5, yep. right? Yep. So if you would have gone Bengals, I was going to go Browns. So honestly, who can really know? I, I think you give – the best analysis of it. And I thought about that this week. You're right. I mean, you, you're going to want to uh, keep the momentum going, as you mentioned, Stefanski said. And and I think you want to keep on that positive note. You have a chance to, to win 12 games. And I think they're going to try to find a way to win this game and stay healthy at the same time, just kind of keep the momentum going and health going. So I think that's a great point by you. I think that um, you could definitely be right. But the, the one thing I will point to is the fact that the Bengals are favored by seven. Yeah. You know how I feel about the Lions in Vegas. So that does give me a little bit of feeling that maybe the Bengals pull this off. They play some of their starters and uh, at home, maybe they get the win. But um, regardless, I don't have a strong feeling either way. I, I could honestly go either way, but I'll go Bengals 20 to 17. Um, don't write me any hate emails or anything <laughs> like that because uh, 
This is simply just to try to tie Scott Petrack. Because here's the bottom line. Next year when we preview the season and we look back, no one's going to ask me how I tied you. They're just right. going to ask me that I tied you. Well, you know, and it's not over, Joe. We got playoff games to pick. Or at we least got, a well, playoff game true. to pick. So, <clears throat> but, yeah. I, but you're, I mean, your reasoning makes all the sense in the world for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell you right now, I'm not picking against the Browns in the first playoff game. I, yeah. I'm just going to tell you that right now. There's no right. there's no way I'm going to watch that game picking uh, the team from the AFC South and going against our Brownies, right? No, I mean, that's where I'm leaning now. And, you know, who knows what could happen in a week. But I'm with you. I mean, I, I the Browns, I, and I think I saw a line somewhere where, where the Browns would be an underdog, like a three-point underdog, at least at Jacksonville. Um, I mean, that surprises me a little bit. Uh, yeah, but I, I, you know, yeah, I'm leaning toward picking the Browns in that first round matchup. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, I think you're probably right about this game Sunday, too, Chad. I think you're right about Vegas and the spread. I mean, Jake Browning's played pretty well. He's not going to want to go out there and end on a bad note. You got Jamar right. Chase playing. Tyler Boyd could be his last game with Cincinnati. Like, they could come out, score a couple early, and the Browns just run it. And, you know, of course, then it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't matter, period. But it really wouldn't matter if the Browns get down 14 nothing and just, say, oh, you know, going to hand off and get out of here healthy. And I could completely understand that. But I think they could also, you know, have something happen and hang around. And, you know, I don't know who's going to play on defense, but this defense is pretty good, right, even when they're missing some pieces. So um, it's going to be interesting. Scott, just to show you how much I have Browns fever right now and how Uh-oh. much I love you, I am yeah. off this week and still found time to do the pod with so, yeah, you. Yeah, no, that's, right? that's why you're the best, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't seen me on this in the mornings, I've been off this week. I'll be back Monday to talk about the Browns Bengals and look forward to the Browns versus the AFC South opponent. Here we go. Let's do this. Oh. My kids are pumped up. Everyone. I mean, my wife's never been so into the Browns watching these games. I mean, it, Hey, we are, we are ready to go. And I know all of Cleveland is. Yeah. This gives us this uh, game in Cincinnati kind of gives you the longer ramp up, right? You have two weeks yeah. to really build up, um, you know, to that playoff game. And it's going to be here before we know it, especially if it's a Saturday game. And you get that yeah. turnaround from Sunday to Saturday, it's going to be like, it'll feel, especially for me, you know, it'll feel breakneck. Trying to get everything done and get everything covered that we need to get covered and fly down to Jacksonville on Friday, like all that stuff, right? It's going to, it's going to come fast and furious. And one thing to think about too is Wherever. the team that you play that if it's the Colts or Texans, they'll have a whole week off if they play on Saturday, where the Jags, exactly. they'll only they'll have one last day. That's I true. feel like did, they obviously looked at that Saturday game and wanted playoff implications, right? Obviously, the Bills-Dolphins was going on Sunday Night Football. I mean, that's the biggest game of the week, right? And what a huge difference to win that division or not, right? Oh, my gosh, yeah. Right, you host, so, you, host yeah. you get the wild card team. Yeah, that's a big game. And, and the Dolphins... They're crumbling a little bit, right? Like they're you can see some cracks in yeah, that armor. So are. it's in Buffalo's been playing well, although they barely beat New England. Um, that's gonna be that's an interesting game. I haven't picked that one yet this week. Um, that's gonna be an interesting one to pick. Wait, this pod just won't end because I, I just know. thought of something else. I mean, coming up with where stuff. I do like where would you put the Browns in the pecking order right now? Like, I mean, I I, yeah. I think you you got oh man i mean ravens one and then like are you going bills or chiefs next and then or could you put the browns in that conversation yeah i mean if you look from like a vegas perspective i think the browns are fourth or fifth betting mm-hmm. favorite in the afc uh you know it's ravens chiefs and it's probably miami buffalo if i had to guess and then cleveland um you know I, here's what I think. I think it's Ravens number one, and then there's a whole bunch of teams, right? Like I think Kansas City's vulnerable, like we talked about. We talked about Miami. Um, Buffalo's been up and down all year. Like I, I think the Ravens are the number one team, and then the next four teams, mm-hmm. right, are kind of in that. I think you could win. I think the Browns could beat any of those teams, and then I think it's a drop off to the AFC South and. The other two wild card teams, or the other wild card team. So, could you could you awesome. imagine Browns versus Ravens in a playoff game? The city that stole our team, yeah, and Flacco against and the, Flacco. the Ravens, right? That yeah. would be amazing. And it could happen. <laughs> we t- it could happen divisional round, depending on how it falls out. It could also happen 
AFC Championship game, right? Depending yep. on how it, how it shakes out. So, I mean, Flacco in Baltimore with a trip to the Super Bowl on the line, that would be that would be unbelievable, Chuck. Yeah, it really would be. All right, well, uh, enjoy the game Sunday, and uh, we'll talk next week. Sounds good, Chud. I really appreciate it. Um, and we will talk next week of a playoff game to preview. I don't know. Have we have did we were we doing this in 2020? I don't feel like I'm not sure we were. Did we yeah, do this? Did okay, we? we did I can't even remember, yeah. Chud. My my life's a blur. Um well actually, when actually, did we actually we probably did because I remember having a, a I don't know, man. I'm have I been doing this up. two years two years or three years with you. I don't know. It's well, I mean that was four 20, years ago. Twenty yeah, maybe. Right? Trying to think. I, think. I don't think we did it that year. I don't yeah, know. maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. I think not. we might have started the next year. So anyway. Um, 21, 22, 20. Yeah, this yeah. is probably our third year. Right? Yeah, so we could be doing our first playoff podcast. That's pretty cool. How about that? Yeah, yeah. that will be fun. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, Chud, as always. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This has been another episode of the Zone Coverage Podcast. And you can create all my work at brownzone.com. Thanks.